dedicated to my son Sean Anthony Steele, in loving memory of my father Richard Steele. Book IV. Kakta E. Let the discussion, therefore, of the intelligible gods, unfolding the mystic doctrine of Plato concerning them be here terminated by us, but it entirely follows in the next place, that we should consider after the same manner the narration concerning the intellectual gods, since, however, of intellectual some are both intelligy. Blay and intellectual, viz. such as according to the oracle perceiving intellectually or at the same time intellectually perceived, but others are intellectual only, this being the case, beginning from those that are intellectual and at the same time intelligible, we will in the first place determine what pertains to them in common, from which we shall render the doctrine concerning each order of them more perspicuous, again, therefore, let us recall to our memory those things which we a little before demonstrated, viz that there are three total monads which are entirely beyond the gods that are divided according to parts, viz essence, life and intellect, and these prior to the partial participate of the superessential unities, essence, however, is exempt from the rest, life is allotted the middle order, but intellect converts the end of this triad to the beginning, and all these are indeed intelligibly in essence, but intelligibly and intellectually in life, and intellectually in intellect, and as secondary natures always participate of the natures placed above them, but these prior to participation presubsist themselves by themselves, and as in each order there are these three things, the cause of abiding, the cause of proceeding, and the cause of conver. Sion, though intellect is more formalized according to conversion, but life according to progression, and essence according to permanency, this being the case, it is certainly necessary that the first intellectual gods being essentialized according to life should conjoin imparticipable intellect, and the intelligible genus of gods, and that they should uniformly connect the various progressions of secondary, but unfold and expand the stable hypoxis of precedaneous causes, for imparticipable life is a thing of this kind, circumscribing that which is primarily being and intellect, and participating indeed of being, but participated by intellect. But this is the same thing as to assert that intelligence is filled indeed from the intelligible, but fills intellect from itself, for being is the intelligible, but life is intelligence, and being indeed is characterized according to a divine hypoxis, but life according to power, and intellect according to intelligible intellect, for as being is to hypoxis, so is intellect to being, and as intelligible power is to each of the extremes, so is life to the intelligible and to intellect and as power is generated from the one and hypoxis, but constitutes in conjunction with the one the nature of being, so life proceeds indeed from being, and gives subsistence to a power different from that which is in being, as also the one itself which exists prior to being, imparts to being from itself a second unity, so likewise life being allotted and hypostasis prior to intellect, generates intellectual life, for true being and the intelligible which precede the rests, supply both life and intellect with union, imparticipable life, therefore, but which participates of the intelligible monads is the second after being, is generative of imparticipable intellect, and giving completion to this medium, and containing the bond of intelligibles and intellectuals, is illuminated by God who are allotted a union secondary to the occult subsistence of intelligibles, but preceding according to cause the separation of intellectual natures, for the unical, indivisible, simple, and primary nature of intelligibles, subsides through the medium of these gods into multitude and separation, and the inexplicable evolution of the divine orders, whence also, I think, the gods who connectedly contain life which is infinite, being the middle of the intelligible and intellectual gods, and carried in the divisions of themselves as in a vehicle, are called intelligible and at the same time intellectual, being filled indeed, from the first intelligibles, but filling the intellectual gods, for we call the intelligible gods intelligible, not as coordinate with intellect, for the intelligible which is in intellect is one thing, and that which produces the intellectual gods another, and we denominate the gods that subsist according to life intelligible and at the same time intellectual, not as giving completion to intellect, nor as being established according to intellectual intelligence, and imparting to intellect the power of intellectual perception, but to the intelligible the power of being intellectually perceived, but we give them this appellation, as deriving their subsistence from the intelligible monads, but generating all the intellectual hebdomads, and because they are illuminated indeed with intelligible life, 
but subsist prior to intellectuals, according to a generative cause, we think fit to denominate them in common, connecting their names from the extremes, in the same manner as they also are allotted a peculiarity collective of holes in the divine orders, it is evident, therefore, that they subsist according to this medium, and that they approximate to the intelligible gods, who are both monadic and triadic, for the intelligible triads. With reference indeed to the highest union and which is exempt from all things, are triads, but with reference to the divided essence of triads, they are monads, unfolding into light from themselves total triads, since intelligibles, therefore, in their triadic progression, do not depart from a unical hypoxis, the intelligible and at the same time intellectual gods subsist triadically, exhibiting in themselves the separation of the monads, and through divine difference, proceeding into multitude, and a variety of powers and essences, for the natures which subsist more remote from the one principle of all things, are more multiplied than the natures which are prior to them, one, and are diminished indeed in powers, and the comprehensions of secondary natures, but are divided in two more numbers, and such as are more distant from the monad, they likewise relinquish the union which is the cause of primarily efficient natures, and variety is assumed by them in exchange for the occult hypoxis of those primary essences. According to this reasoning, therefore, the intelligible and intellectual separation is greater than the separation which is only intelligible, and of these again, the partial orders are allotted on much greater division, so, as to unfold to us a multitude of gods which cannot be comprehended in the numbers within the decade, their peculiarities also are indescribable, and inexplicable by our conceptions, and are manifest only to the gods themselves, and to the causes of them, such, therefore, are the intelligible and intellectual gods, and such is the peculiarity which they are allotted, a peculiarity connective of extremes, and which unfolds into light precedaneous, but converts secondary natures, for they intellectually perceive the gods prior to them, but are objects of intellection to the gods posterior to them, hence also Timos establishes all perfect animal to be the most beautiful of intelligibles, because there are intelligibles posterior to it, which it surpasses in beauty, as being superior to them, and because it is the boundary of the first intelligibles, the natures posterior to it subsisting intellectually, according to this reasoning, therefore, the first intellectual gods are also intelligible, and we do not, deriving these things from a foreign source, ascribe them to Plato, but they are asserted by us in consequence of receiving auxiliaries from him, this, however, will be more manifest through what follows. Chapter I. In the next place, Therefore, we shall discuss the manner in which the gods who illuminate the breadth of imparticipable life proceed from the intelligible gods, since then the intelligible gods establish in themselves uniformly things multiplied, occultly such as are divided, and according to a certain admirable transcendency of simplicity, the various genera of beings, hence the first intellectual gods, too, unfolding their indistinct union, and the unknown nature of their hypostasis, and being filled through intelligible power and essential life with the prolific abundance of holes, are allotted a kingdom which ranks as the second after them, and they always indeed produce, perfect, and connect themselves, but receive from the intelligible gods an occult generation, from intelligible power indeed, receiving a peculiarity generative of all things, but from intelligible life which pre-exists according to cause in the intelligible, receiving the nature which is spread under them. For life is primarily indeed in intelligibles, but secondarily in intelligibles and intellectuals, and in a third degree in intellectuals, existing indeed according to cause in the first, but according to essence in the second. And according to participation in the last of these, the first intellectual, therefore, proceed from the intelligible gods, multiplying indeed their union, and their unical powers, unfolding their occult epoxis, and through prolific, connective and perfective causes are simulating themselves to the essential, entire, and all-perfect transcendences of intelligibles, for in intelligibles there were three primarily effective powers, one indeed constituting the essence of wholes, another measuring things which are multiplied, and another being productive of the forms of all generated natures, and conformably to these, the intelligible and intellectual powers subsists, one indeed, by its very essence producing the life of secondary natures, according to a certain intelligible comprehension, but another being connective of everything which is divided, and imparting by illumination the intelligible measure to those natures that relinquish the one union of all things, and another supplying all things with figure, 
and form and perfection, the intelligible and intellectual orders of the gods, therefore, are generated according to all the intelligible causes, from power indeed, being allotted the peculiarity of progression, but from life receive. I the portion of being which is suspended from them, for life is conjoined with power, since life is of itself infinite, or motion having infinity consubsistent with its nature, and the power of infinity, is generative of the whole of things, but from the dryadic hypostasis of intelligibles, they receive a distribution into firsts, middle and last, for it is necessary that all things should be detained by a triadic progression, and that this should be the case prior to all, other, things with the intelligible and at the same time intellectual genera of gods, for because they subsist as the middle of wholes, and give completion to the bond of the first orders, according to their summit indeed, they are assimilated to intelligibles, but according to their extremity, to intellectuals, and they are partly indeed intelligible, and partly intellectual, for everywhere the progressions of the divine genera are effected through continued similitude, and the first of subordinate are united to the ends of pre-existent causes, as however, the first and the last in the middle of holes are both intelligible and intellectual, it is necessary there should be a connective medium of these, according to which medium the peculiarity of these gods is principally apparent, for that which is intelligible and at the same time intellectual, in one part indeed is more abundant than, but in another it equally communicates with both these, from these things, therefore, the continuity of the progression of the divine orders appears to be admirable, for the extremity of intelligibles indeed was intellectual, yet as in intelligibles, but the summit of intelligibles and at the same time intellectuals, is intelligible indeed, yet it possesses this peculiarity vitally, and again, the end of intelligibles and at the same time intellectuals, is intellectual, but it is vitally so, but the beginning of intellectuals, is intelligible, and presides over the intellectual gods, yet it has the intelligible intellectually, and thus all the divine genera are allotted an indissoluble connection and communion, an admirable friendship, and well-ordered diminution, and a transcendency, partly coordinate and partly exempt, that which proceeds to is always in continuity with its producing cause, and secondary natures together with a firm establishment in their causes, make a progression from them, there is likewise one series and alliance of all things, secondary natures always subsisting from those prior to them, through similitude, after what manner, there. 4. The intelligible and at the same time intellectual gods, unfold themselves into light from the intelligible gods, may through these things be recollected. Chapter III. In the next place, let us show how they are divided in their progressions, and what difference the triads of these gods are allotted with respect to the intelligible triads. These gods, therefore, are also divided triply, after the above-mentioned manner, being conjoined indeed to the intelligible, through their summit, but to the intellectual through their end, and through the middle bond of the extremes, being allotted the peculiarity of each equally, and extending to both the intelligible and intellectual genera of gods as the center of these two fold orders, uniformly containing the communion of wholes, they are likewise divided triply, because in these all things, viz essence, life, and intellect, are vitally, in the same manner as they are intelligibly in the gods prior to them, and intellectually in the gods that derive their subsistence from these, and essence indeed is the intelligible of life, but life is the middle and at the same time the peculiarity of this order. And intellect is the extremity, and that which is proximately carried in intellectuals is in a vehicle, all things therefore subsisting in these gods, there will be a division of them into firsts, middle, and last genera, and in the third place, they are divided triply, because it is necessary that life should abide, proceed, and be converted to its principles, since of beings, the first triad was said to establish all things, and prior to other things the second triad, eternity, therefore, abides stably in the first triad. But the triad posterior to this, is the supplier to wholes, and therefore to all things, of progression, motion, and life according to energy, and the third triad is the supplier of conversion to the one, and of perfection which convolves all secondary natures to their principles, hence it is necessary that the intelligible and at the same time intellectual gods, should primarily participate of these three powers, and should abide indeed in the summit of themselves, but proceeding from thence and extending themselves to all things, should again be converted to the intelligible place of survey, and conjoined to the beginning of their generation the end of their whole progression.
the intelligible and at the same time intellectual gods therefore are, as I have said, triply divided, and essence indeed is that which ranks as first in them, but life is the middle, and intellect the extremity of them, since however, each of these three is perfect, and participates of the intelligible monads, I mean of the essence which is there, of intelligible life, and of intelligible intellect, they are tripled according to the participation of primarily efficient causes, and the intelligible of life indeed possesses essence, intellect, and life intelligibly, but the intelligible and intellectual of it, possesses essence, life and intellect, intelligibly and at the same time intellectually, and the intellectual of it possesses these intellectually and intelligibly, three, and everywhere indeed, there is a triad in each of the sections, but in conjunction with an appropriate peculiarity, hence three intelligible and at the same time intellectual triads present themselves to our view, which are indeed illuminated by the divine unities, but each of them contains an all-various multitude, for since in intelligibles, there was an all-powerful and all-perfect multitude, how is it possible that this multitude should not in a much greater degree, be evolved and multiplied, in the God secondary to the intelligible order, according to the prolific cause of them, each triad therefore comprehends in itself a multitude of powers, and a variety of forms, producing intelligible multitude into energy, and enfolding into light the generative infinity of intelligibles, and we indeed, being impelled from the participants, discover the peculiarity of the participated super-essential gods, but according to the order of things, the intelligible and intellectual monads generate about themselves essences, and all lives, and the intellectual genera, and through these, they unfold the unknown transcendency of themselves, preserving by itself the pre-existent cause of the whole of things. There are however, as we have said, three intelligible triads, and there are also three triads posterior to these, which appear to be tripled from them, according to their prolific perfection. But it is necessary that the peculiarity of the intelligible, and also of the intelligible and at the same time intellectual triad, should be defined according to another mode, for in the intelligible order indeed, each, triad had only the third part of being, for it consisted of bound, and infinity, and from both these, but this was essence indeed in the first triad, intelli. Jibble life in the second, and intelligible intellect in the third, the natures however prior to these were unities and super-essential powers, which give completion to the whole triads, but in the intelligible and at the same time intellectual order, each triad has essence, life and intellect, one indeed intelligibly and at the same time intellectually, but more intelligibly, so far as it is in continuity with the first intelligibles, but another intellectually and intelligibly, but more intellectually, because it is proximately carried in intellectuals, and another according to an equal part, as it comprehends in itself both the peculiarities. Hence the first triad, that we may speak of each, was in intelligibles, downed, infinity, and essence, for essence was that which was primarily mixed, but here the first triad is essence, life and intellect, with appropriate unities, for essence is suspended from the first deity of this triad, life from the second, and intellect from the third, and these three super-essential monads, unfold the monads of the first triad, but again, the second triad after this, was in the intelligible order, a super-essential unity, power, and intelligible and occult life. Here however, essence, life and intellect are all vital, and are suspended from the gods who contain the one bond of the whole of this order. For as the first unities were allotted a power unific of the middle genera, so the second unities after them, exhibit the connective peculiarity of primarily efficient causes. After these therefore, succeeds the third triad which in the intelligible order indeed was unity, power, and intelligible intellect, but here it consists of three super-essential gods, who close the termination of the intelligible and at the same time intellectual gods, and begird all things intellectually, I mean essence, life and intellect, they are likewise the supplies of divine perfection, for, imitating the all-perfect intelligible triad, just as the connectedly containing gods imitate the intelligible measure, and the gods prior to these, the generative cause of intelligibles, the three intelligible therefore, and at the same time intellectual triads, are thus generated, and are allotted such a difference as this, with respect to the intelligible triads. Chapter IV. Again however, returning to Plato, let us accord with him, and exhibit the science which pre-exists with him concerning each of these triads, and in the first place, let us assume what is 
written in the Phaedrus, and survey from the words themselves of Socrates, how he unfolds to us the whole of the orderly distinction of these triads, and the differences which it contains. In the Phaedrus therefore, there are said to be twelve leaders who preside over the whole of mundane concerns, and who conduct all the mundane gods, and all the herds of demons, and convert them to the intelligible nature. It is also said that Jupiter is the leader of all these twelve gods, that he drives a winged chariot, adorns and takes care of all things, and brings all the army of gods that follow him, first indeed to the place of survey within the heaven, and to the blessed spectacles, and discursive energies of the intelligibles which are there. But in the next place Jupiter brings them to the sub-celestial arch which proximately begirds the heaven, and is contained in it, and after this to the heaven itself, and the back of heaven, where also divine souls stand, and being born along together with the heaven, survey all the essence that is beyond it. Socrates further adds, that prior to the heaven there is what is called the super-celestial place, in which true and real essence, the plane of truth, the kingdom of Adrastra, and the divine choir of virtues subsists, and that souls being nourished through the intellection of these monads, are happily affected, following, in their contemplation, the circulation of the heaven. These things therefore, are asserted in the Phaedrus, Socrates being clearly inspired by divinity, and discussing mystic concerns. It is necessary however, prior to other things, to consider what the heaven is of which Socrates speaks, and in what order of beings it is established. For having discovered this, we may also survey the sub-celestial arch, and the super-celestial place, 5, for each of these is assumed according to habitude towards the heaven, the one ended being primarily placed above it, but the other being primarily arranged under it. Chapter V. What therefore is the heaven to which Jupiter leads the gods? For, if we should say that it is the sensible heaven, as certain other persons say it is, it will be necessary that the more excellent generous should be converted to things naturally subordinate to themselves. For if Jupiter the mighty leader are in the heaven proceeds to this sensible heaven, and leads to it all the gods that follow him, he will have a conver. Sion to things subordinate, and posterior to himself, and together with Jupiter, this will also be the case with all the leaders, and the gods and damons suspended from these, though the same Socrates in the Phaedrus says, that even a partial soul when perfected is conversant with sublime concerns, and governs the whole world, how is it possible therefore, that the leaders of whole souls should be converted to the sensible heaven, and exchange the intelligible place of survey for an inferior allotment, when through these souls they preside over the universe, in order that they may illuminate mundane natures with a liberated and unrestrained power. In addition to these things also, what are the blessed intellections of the gods within this sensible heaven, and what are the evolutions of all the knowledge of sensibles? 6. For in short the gods know sensibles, not by a conversion to them, but by containing in themselves the causes of them. Hence intellectually perceiving themselves, they know sensibles causally, and rule over them, not by looking to them, and verging to the subjects of their government, but by converting through love inferior natures to themselves. Neither therefore, is it lawful for the gods who adorn the whole of heaven, and think it worthy their providential care, to be ever situated under the circulation of this heaven, nor is there any blessedness in the contemplation of the things which exist under it, nor are the souls that are converted to this contemplation among the number of those that are happy, and that follow the gods, but they rank among those that exchange intelligible for doxastic nutriment, such as Socrates says, the souls are that are lame, that have broken their wings, and are in a merged condition, since therefore passions of this kind belong to partial souls, and these not such as are happy, how can we refer a conversion to the sensible heaven to the ruling and leading gods? Farther still, Socrates says that souls standing on the back of the heaven, are carried round by the circumvolution itself of the heaven, but Timorce, and the Athenian guests say, that souls led everything in the heavens by their own motions, externally cover bodies with their motions, and living their own life through the whole of time, impart to bodies secondarily efficient powers of motion. How therefore do these things accord with those who make this heaven to be sensible? For souls do not contemplate and dance round intelligibles, through the circulation of the heavens, but through the unapparent convolution of souls, bodies revolve in a circle, and about these perform their circulations. If therefore any one should say that the sensible heaven circumvolves souls, and that it is divided according to the back, the profundity, and the subcelestial arch, many absurdities must necessarily be admitted. But if someone should say that the heaven is intelligible, to which Jupiter is the leader, but all the gods, 
and together with these, demons follow him, he will unfold the divinely, inspired narrations of Plato consentaneously to the nature of things, and will follow the most celebrated of his interpreters, for Plotinus and Jamblichus are of opinion that this heaven is a certain intelligible, and prior to these, Plato himself in the Cratylus following the Orphic the Argonis calls the father indeed of Jupiter, Saturn, but of Saturn, heaven, and he evinces that Jupiter is the demiurgus of the whole of things through the names, by which he is called, investigating for this purpose the truth concerning them, but he shows that Saturn is connective of a divine intellect, and that heaven is the intelligence, or intellectual perception of the first intelligibles, for sight, says he, looking to the things above, is heaven. Hence heaven subsists prior to every divine intellect, with which the mighty Saturn is replete, but intellectually perceives the things above, and such as are beyond the celestial order. The mighty heaven therefore, is allotted a kingdom which is between the intelligible and intellectual orders, for the circulation mentioned in the Phaedrus is intelligence, through which all the gods and souls obtain the contemplation of intelligibles. But intelligence is a medium between intellect and the intelligible. It must be said therefore, that the whole of heaven is established according to this medium, and that it contains the one bond of the divine orders, being the father indeed of the intellectual genus, but being generated from the kings prior to it, which also it is said to see, but on one side of it the super celestial place, and on the other the sub celestial arch must be arranged. Chapter VI. Again therefore, if indeed the super celestial place is the imparticipable and occult genus of the intelligible gods, how can we establish so great a divine multitude there, and this accompanied with separation, viz. truth, science, jus, tice, temperance, the meadow, and adrastra, for neither do the fountains of the virtues, nor the separation and variety of forms, pertain to the intelligible gods, for the first and most unical of forms extend the demiurgic intellect of holes to the intelligible paradigm, and the comprehension of forms which is there. But Socrates in the Phaedrus says that a partial intellect contemplates the super celestial place, for this intellect is the governor of the soul, as it is well said by the philosophers prior to us. If therefore, it be necessary from this analogy to investigate the difference of intelligibles, as the demiurgic intellect indeed, is imparticipable, but a partial intellect is participable, so with respect to the intelligible, one indeed which is the first paradigm of the demiurgus, pertains to the first intelligibles but another which is the first paradigm of a partial intellect pertains to the second intelligibles, which are indeed intelligibles, but are allotted an intelligible transcendency, subsisting at the summit of intellectuals, but if the super celestial place is beyond the celestial circulation, but is inferior to those intelligible triads, because it is more expanded, for it is the plane of truth, and it's not unknown, is divided according to a multitude of forms, and possesses a variety of powers, and the meadow which is there nourishes souls, and is visible to them, the first intelligibles illuminating souls with ineffable union, but not being known by them through intelligence, if this be the case, it is certainly necessary that the super celestial place should subsist between the intelligible nature, and the celestial circulation, if Plato himself also admits that essence which truly is, exists in this place, how is it possible that he should not also admit it to be intelligible, and to participate of the first intelligibles, for because indeed it is essence it is intelligible, but because it truly is, it participates of being, moreover, possessing in itself a multitude of intelligibles, it will not be arranged according to the first triad, for the one being is there, and not the multitude of beings, but possessing a various life which the meadow indicates, it is subordinate to the second triad. For intelligible life is one, and without separation, and again, since it shines forth to the view with divided forms, all various orders, and prolific powers, it falls short of the all-perfect triad, in intelligibles, if therefore it is the second to these in dignity and power, but is established above the celestial order, it is intelligible indeed, but is the summit of the intellectual gods, on this account also, nutriment is derived to souls from thence. For the intelligible is nutriment, since the first intelligibles also, viz. the beautiful, the wise and the good, are said to nourish souls. For by this, says Socrates the wing of the soul is nourished, but by the contraries to these it is corrupted and destroyed. These things however, are indeed affected by the first intelligibles exemptly, and through union and silence. But the super celestial place is said to nourish through intelligence and energy, 
and to fill the happy choir of souls with intelligible light, and the prolific rivers of life. Chapter VI. After the super celestial place however and the heaven itself, is the sub-celestial arch, which it is obvious to everyone ought to be arranged under the heaven, and not in the heaven, for it is not called by Plato the celestial, but the sub-celestial arch, that it is also proximately situated under the celestial circulation, is evident from what is written concerning it, but if it be necessary to make the sub-celestial arch being such, the same with the summit of intellectuals, and not with the end of the intelligible and intellectual gods, it will be now necessary to contemplate what remains, for the summit of intellectuals separates itself from the kingdom of the heaven, but the sub-celestial arch is on all sides comprehended by it, and the former indeed constitutes the whole of intellect, intellectual multitude, and as Socrates says, the blessed discursive energies of the gods, but the latter only bound the celestial series, and supplies the gods with the means of ascending to the heaven, for when the gods are elevated to the banquet and the delicious food, and are filled with intelligible goods, then they proceed ascending, to the sub-celestial arch, and through it raised to the celestial circulation. Hence, if you say that the sub-celestial arch is perfective of the gods, and converts them to the whole of the heaven, and the super-celestial place, you will not wander from the meaning of Plato, for the gods are indeed nourished by the intelligible, by the meadow, and by the divine forms, which the place above the heaven comprehends, but they are filled with this nutriment through the sub-celestial arch, for through this they also participate of the celestial circulation, hence they are converted indeed, through the sub-celestial arch, but they receive a vigorous intellect to a perception from the celestial order, and they are filled with intelligible goods from the super-celestial place. It is evident therefore, that the super-celestial place is allotted an intelligible summit, but the circulation of the heaven, the middle breadth, and the arch, the intelligible extremity, for all things are in it, and intellect indeed is convertive, but the intelligible is the object of desire, but divine intelligence gives completion to the middle, perfecting indeed the conversions of divine natures, and binding them to such as are firsts, but unfolding the tendencies to intelligibles, and filling secondary natures with precedaneous goods. I think however, that through these things we have sufficiently reminded the reader of the order of these three. Chapter VIE. Perhaps however, someone may ask us, why we here characterize the whole progression of the intelligible and at the same time intellectual gods, according to the middle, and why we call one of the extremes super-celestial, but the other sub-celestial, from their habitude to the middle, indicating the exempt transcendency of the one, but the proximate and connected diminution of the other, perhaps therefore, we may concisely answer such a one, that this whole genus of the intelligible and at the same time intellectual gods, binds together both the extremes, being to the one the cause of conversion, but to the other of becoming unfolded into light, and being present with secondary natures, as therefore, we denominate all the intelligible gods paternal and unical, characterizing, them from the summit, and as we say that they are the boundaries of the whole of things, viz those that are effective of essence, those that are the causes of perpetuity, and those that are the sources of the production of forms, after the same manner we unfold these middle gods as the leaders of all bonds, from the middle which is in them, for the whole of this middle order is vivific, connective and perfective, but the summit of it indeed, unfolds the impressions of intelligibles, and their ineffable union, the termination of it converts intellectuals, and conjoins, them to intelligibles, and the middle collects into, and fixes in itself as in a center the whole genera of the gods, for to the extremes also through reference to the middle we attribute the habitude of transcendency and diminution, calling the one above, but the other under the middle. Chapter IX. Through these things therefore, we may concisely answer him, as I have said, who doubts concerning these names, here however it is fit that we should admire the divine science of Plato, because he has narrated the mode of the ascent of the whole of things to the intelligible conformably to the highest of initiators, for in the first place, he elevates souls and the gods themselves to the fountains, through the liberated leaders, for the blessed and most abundant spectacles and discursive energies are particularly in these fountains, in which also theurgists place all their hope of salvation. They are therefore blessed through the unpolluted monads, but they are most abundant through the cause of divine difference, and they are spectacles and discursive energies, through the intellectual and paternal powers. But in the second place, Plato elevates souls and gods from the fountains, and through the fountains to the leaders of perfection, 
for after many am divided intellections the good of the perfective God shines forth, being supernally expanded from the intellectual gods themselves, and illuminating us, and prior to our souls, whole souls, and prior to these, the gods themselves, but from the perfective gods Plato elevates souls and gods to the divinities, who are connective of all the intellectual orders, for the perfective gods are suspended from these divinities, subsist together with them, and are comprehended by them, such also is the communion and union of these gods, that some of the most celebrated, interpreters of Plato, have supposed that there is an all-perfect and indivisible sameness among them, in consequence of not being able to apprehend by a reasoning process a separation which is in them, for here also, it may appear to someone that Plato calls the extremity of the celestial circulation, the arch, this however is not the case, for he does not denominate the arch celestial, but sub-celestial, as therefore, the super-celestial is essentially exempt from the heaven, Thus also the sub-celestial is inferior to the kingdom of the heaven, for the former indeed is indicative of transcendency, but the latter of approximately arranged diminution. After this circulation however, which is connective of the whole of things, Plato elevates souls and the gods to the super-celestial place, and the intelligible union of intellectuals, where also the gods abiding, are nourished, are in a happy condition, and are filled with ineffable and unical goods, for with Theogis also, the ascent to the ineffable and intelligible powers which are the summits of all intellectuals, is through the connected gods, in what manner however, the gods are here conjoined to the first intelligibles, Plato no longer unfolds through words, for the contact with them is ineffable, and through ineffables, as he also teaches in what he says about them in the Phaedrus, and through this order the mystic union with the intelligible and first producing causes is effected, with this therefore, there is also the same mode of conjunction, and through this, the mode of theurgic ascent is more credible, for as holds are sent to exempt principles, through the natures proximately placed above them, thus also parts imitating the ascent of holes, are conjoined through middle steps of ascent, with the most simple and ineffable causes, for what Plato has delivered in this dialogue concerning whole souls, he afterwards unfolds concerning ours, and in the first place indeed, he conjoins them with the liberated gods. Afterwards, through these he elevates them to the perfective gods, afterwards, through these, to the connective gods, and in a similar manner, as far as to the intelligible gods, Socrates therefore, narrating the mode of ascent to intelligible beauty, and how following the gods prior to bodies and generation, we were partakers of that blessed spectacle, says, for it was then lawful to see splendid beauty, when we obtained together with that happy choir, this blessed vision and spectacle, we indeed following Jupiter, but others in conjunction with some other god, perceiving, and being initiated in those mysteries, which it is lawful to call the most blessed of mysteries, how then were we once conjoined with intelligible beauty, through being initiated, says he, in the most blessed of mysteries, what else therefore, does this assert, than that we were conjoined with the perfective leaders, and were initiated by them, in order to our being replenished with beauty, of what goods therefore, is the initiation the procurer, which orges, says he, was celebrated by us, when we were entire and impassive, and were initiated in, and became spectators of entire, simple, and quietly stable visions, the entire therefore, is derived to souls from the celestial circulation, for this contains, and is connective of all the divine genera, and also of our souls, everything however, which in the whole contains parts, comprehends also that which is divided, and that which is various into union and simplicity but the entire, quietly stable, and simple visions, are unfolded to souls supernally from the super-celestial place, through the connectedly containing gods, for the mystic impressions of intelligibles, shine forth in that place, and also the unknown and ineffable beauty of characters, for Muasis and Epicheia, seven, are symbols of ineffable silence, and of union with mystic natures through intelligible visions, and that which is the most admirable of all is this, that as Theogis ordered the whole body to be buried, except the head, in the most mystic of initiations, Plato also has anticipated this, being moved by the gods themselves, for being pure, says he, and liberated from the surrounding vestment, which we now denominate body, we obtained this most blessed Muasis and Epicheia, being full of intelligible light, for the pure splendor, which he mentions, symbolically unfolds to us intelligible light, hence, when we are situated in the intelligible, we shall have a life perfectly.
liberated from the body, but elevating the head of the charioteer to the place beyond the heaven, we shall be filled with the mysteries which there, and with intelligible silence. It also appears to me that Plato sufficiently unfolds the three elevating causes, love, truth, and faith, to those who do not negligently read what he has written, for what besides love conjoins with beauty, where is the plane of truth, except in this place, and what else and faith is the cause of this ineffable muasis, for muasis in short, is neither through intelligence nor judgment, but through the unical silence imparted by faith, which is better than every Gnostic energy and which establishes both whole souls and ours, in the ineffable and unknown nature, 8, of the gods. These things however, have proceeded to this length from my sympathy about such like concerns. Chapter X. But again returning to the proposed theology, let us unfold the conceptions which Plato indicates to us concerning each order of the intelligible and at the same time intellectual gods. The super-celestial place therefore is intelligible, hence also Plato says that it is essence which truly is, and that it is visible to the intellect of the soul, it is likewise the one comprehension and union of the intellectual gods, for it is not intelligible after such a manner as animal itself, nor as the first eternity, nor as that which is itself primarily the one being, for as these are primarily intelligibles, they are exempt from all other intelligibles, and presubsist by themselves, but the super celestial place, is proximately established above the celestial circulation, and of this is the intelligible, yet it is not simply intelligible, and that we assert these things rightly, Socrates also testifies, imparting the intellection of this intelligible to souls likewise, through the heaven, for in this period, according to which they are carried round together with the circulation of the heaven, they behold indeed justice, they behold temperance, and they also behold science, and each of the beings which have a true and real existence, so that if the super celestial place is intelligible, and real being, yet it is intelligible, as being above the heaven, the first intelligibles however, are intelligible according to their own essence, and according to the exempt and first efficient cause of all intellectual natures, for the mighty Saturn likewise, though he is an intel, lectual God, and the fullness of intellect, is intelligible as with reference to the Demiurgus, for he is the summit of the intellectual triad, thus therefore, the place also which is above the heaven, is allotted an intelligible transcendency with respect to the celestial circulation, and is intelligible as in the first intellectuals, 9, hence also it subsists analogous to the first triad of intelligibles, that triad however, was simply intelligible, for the intelligible which is in intelligibles, at once exists prior to all second and third intelligibles, but the super celestial place is not simply intelligible, for it is the summit of intellectuals, and not of intelligibles, hence Plato calls the first triad of intelligibles the one being, but he denominates the super celestial place, truly existing essence, for the former indeed, antecedes all beings in an admirable simplicity, and in the occult unity of being, for that being is the intelligible itself, and is not in one respect intelligible, but in another intellectual, nor is it that which is passive too, viz participates of being, but it is the seat, and the most ancient monad of being. This order however, viz the super celestial place, falls short of the union of the triad, and participates of being, but it's not simply being, hence. Also Plato calls it essence, and essence which truly is, as receiving this intelligible and essential according to the essence of that which is primarily being, and the first triad indeed of intelligibles was paternal, for it subsists according to divine union and bound, and is the occult, and highest boundary of all intelligibles but the super-celestial place is maternal, subsisting according to infinity, and the power of infinity, for this order is feminine and prolific, and produces all things by intelligible powers, hence also, Plato calls it a place, as being the receptacle of the paternal causes, and bringing forth, and producing the generative powers of the gods into the hypostasis of secondary natures, for having denominated matter also a place, he calls it the mother nurse of the reasons, i.e. of the productive principles, which proceed into it from being, and the paternal cause, according to this analogy, therefore, Plato thus denominates the super celestial place, as feminine, and as being the cause of those things maternally, of which the intelligible father is the cause paternally, matter however receives forms alone, but the mother nurse of the gods, not only receives, but also constitutes Angen. Ere its secondary natures, together with the father, 
nor does this generative deity produce from herself into an external place, her progeny, and separate them from her own comprehension, in the same manner as the natures which generate here, deliver their offspring into light external to themselves, but she generates, comprehends and establishes all things in herself, hence also she is the place of them, as being a seat which on all sides contains them, and as by her prolific, and primarily efficient powers, preoccupying and containing in herself, all the progressions, multitude and variety of secondary natures, for all beings subsist in the gods, and are comprehended and saved by them, for where can they recede from the gods, and from the comprehension which is in them, and how, if they depart from them, can they remain even for the smallest portion of time, in a particular manner however the powers which are generative of divine natures, are said to comprehend their progeny, so far as they are the proximate causes of them, and constitute their essence with a more abundant division, and a more particular providence, for paternal causes produce secondary natures uniformly, exemptly, and without coordination, and comprehend, but uniquely their own progeny, and in simplicity indeed, they preoccupy the variety of them, but in union their multitude, it is evident therefore, from what has been said, that the super celestial place is intelligible, and after what manner it is intelligible, in addition to these things also it is evident, how it is feminine, for place is adapted to generative gods through the above mentioned causes, and the meadow is the fountain of a vivific nature, as will be shortly demonstrated, Socrates likewise assumes all the divine natures that are in this place to be of this kind, viz to be of the feminine genus, I mean science herself, justice herself temperance herself, truth herself, and adrastia which may especially be considered as a certain indication, that Plato particularly attributes the feminine to this order, and not only other theologists. Chapter 11. What therefore is the cause through which Plato in the first place celebrates this deity negatively, analogous to the one, and what are the negations, for he denominates it, without color, without figure, and without contact, and he takes away from it these three hypoxes, color, figure, and contact, I say therefore, that this order being the summit of the intellectual gods, is unknown and ineffable, according to its peculiarity, and is, only, to be known through intelligible impressions, for being the summit of intellectuals, it conjoins itself with intelligibles, for how could intellectuals be conjoined with intelligibles, unless they antecedently constituted an intelligible transcendency of themselves, but what connection and communion could be surveyed of the whole orders of things? unless the extremities of such as are first possessed a certain similitude to the beginnings of such as are second, for on account of this similitude, these are connoissant with each other, and all things subsist according to one series, as therefore, the end of intelligibles was intellectual, so likewise the beginning of intellectuals is allotted an intelligible hypoxis, and each of these indeed is intelligible, but the one is intelligible simply, and the other is not intelligible without the addition of the intellectual. These therefore, are consubsistent with each other, and the one indeed, is the paternal cause of the whole of things, so far as it is intelligible, and the intellectual which is in it is extended intelligibly, but the other is generatively constitutive of the same things, because it is intellect. Tall, and intelligible good presides in the intellectual genus, all things therefore, are from both, exemptly indeed, from the intellectual of intelligibles, but coordinately from the intelligible of intellectuals, and both indeed, rejoice in unknown hypoxes, and are alone, as Plato says, known by intelligible, mystic, and ineffable impressions, hence also he calls the attempt boldness which endeavors to unfold the arcana concerning them, and to explain by words their unknown union, from the end of the intelligible order however, the summit of intellectuals possesses its unknown peculiarity, for so far as it conjoins itself to the first intelligibles, and is filled with their unical, ineffable, and paternal hypoxis, so far also it exists in an unknown manner prior to intellectuals, hence it is incomprehensible by the natures posterior to it, but it is known by those prior to it, being super expanded into a continued union with them, 10, it likewise knows the natures prior to itself intelligibly, but this does not at all differ from uniform and ineffable knowledge, for intelligible knowledge is the union, cause, summit, and unknown and occult hypoxis of all knowledge, since therefore, the one and united triad is, if it be lawful. So to speak, the intellectual image of the unknown union of intelligibles, 
and presides over the same uniform and unknown power in intellectuals, as its own cause does, hence Plato mystically unfolds it through negations, for everywhere that which is highest, and that which is unknown, are analogous to the unical God, as therefore, we are taught to celebrate this God through negations, after the same manner we endeavor to unfold negatively the uniform and unknown summits of secondary orders, and in short, since Socrates in the Phaedrus makes the ascent as far as to the super-celestial place, arranging it analogous to the firsts, as in this order, and in the ascent of souls, he celebrates it by negations, for in the Timors, Plato contends that the one Demiurgus through whom every Demiurgic genus of God subsists, is an effable and unknown, and everywhere that which is highest has this transcendency with respect to secondary natures, for it imitates the cause which is at once unically exempt from all beings. We celebrate this cause however, through negations alone, as existing prior to all things, but we unfold the summits which proceed analogous to it, affirmatively and at the same time negatively, as participating indeed. The natures prior to themselves, we celebrate them affirmatively, for Plato calls the super-celestial place essence which truly is, the plane of truth, the meadow, and the intelligible place of survey of the gods, and he does not only call it without color, without figure, and without contacts thus mingling affirmations with negations, for this order is a medium between the intelligible gods and the first intellectual divine orders, containing the bond of both, and it guards indeed intellectually according to a uniform and unknown transcendency, but transmits the plenitudes of intelligibles as far as to the last of things, it likewise elevates all things at once, according to one common union, as far as to the intelligible father, and generates and produces them as far as to matter, being therefore established between the unical and the multiplied gods, it is unfolded, negatively indeed, through the unknown manner in which it transcends secondary natures, but affirmatively through its participation of the first natures, for the first Demiurgus is called in the Timor's fabricator and father, and good, and all such names, so far as he participates of pre-existent causes, but so far as he is the monad of all fabrication, Plato leaves him unknown and in a fable, exempt from all the fabricators of things, for he says, it is difficult to discover him, and when found, it is impossible to speak of him to all men, thus therefore Plato unfolds the super-celestial place, affirmatively indeed, as being filled from the first causes, at one time indeed calling it essence which truly is, at another the plane of truth, and at another, something else of this kind, but, eleven, so far as it transcends the intellectual gods, and so far as it is supreme on unical, he celebrates it negatively, in the same manner as the principle which is exempt from all things. Chapter Zi. It follows therefore, in the next place, that we should consider what the negations are, and from what orders they are generated. In the Parmenides then, the negations of the one are produced from all the divine orders, because the one is the cause of all of them and everything divine according to the hypoxis of itself participates of the first principle, and the one in consequence of transcending these is in a much greater degree exempt from the natures posterior to these, for from these all things proceed, since they receive partibly the peculiarities of these, this however is evident from the other hypotheses, in which the same conclusions are again circulated, at one time being connected together negatively, and at another affirmatively. For what is there which could be able to subsist, unless it was antecedently comprehended according to cause in holes? But in the Phaedrus, the things which are denied of the intelligible summit of all intellectuals are the natures which approximately established after this summit, viz. the sacred genera, the connective, the perfective, and the paternal of what are properly called intellectuals. For this summit being exempt from these, it also transcends all the intellectual gods. For what every genus of the gods is to the one, that the three orders posterior to this summit, are to it, Plato therefore denominates the celestial order which connectedly contains wholes, and illuminates them with intelligible light, color, because likewise the apparent beauty of this sensible heaven is resplendent with all various colors, and with light, hence he calls that heaven intellectual color, and light, for the light proceeding from the good is, in the orders, above, the heaven, unknown and occult, abiding in the editor of the gods, but it shines forth in this order, and from being unapparent becomes manifests, hence it is assimilated to color the offspring of light, farther still, if the heaven is sight beholding the things above, the intelligible of it may very properly be called color which is conjoined with the sight, 
The cause therefore of the intelligibles in the heaven is without color, but is exempt from them, for sensible color is the offspring of the solar light, but Plato denominates the order which proximately subsists after the celestial order, and which we have called the subcelestial arch, figure, for the arch itself is the name of a figure, and in short, in this order, Parmenides also places intellectual figure, but Plato first attributes contact to the summit of intellectuals, as is evident from the conclusions of the Parmenides, for in the first hypothesis taking away figure from the one, he uses this as a medium, viz that the one does not touch itself, but the one says he, does not touch itself, and the conclusion is evident, here therefore contact first subsists, and subsists according to cause, for of those things of which the demiurgus is proximately the cause, the father who is prior to him is paradigmatically the cause, in this order therefore, contact is the paradigm of the liberated gods, hence these three orders are successive, viz color, figure, and contact, and from these the super celestial place is essentially exempt, hence it is without color, without figure, and without contact, nor does it transcend these three privatively, but according to causal excellence, for it imparts to color from intelligibles the participation of light, on figure it confers by illumination intellectual bound, and in contact it supernally inserts union and continuity, and perfects all things by its power, things which are touched indeed, through union, those that are figured, through the participation of bound, and those that are colored, through the illumination of light, but it draws upward, and allures to itself everything ineffably and through intelligible impressions, and fills everything with unical goods, if therefore, we assert these things rightly, we must not admit the interpretation of those who are busily occupied in sensible colors, and contacts, and figures, and who assert that the super celestial place is exempt from these, for these are trifling, and by no means adapted to that place, for even nature, not only that which exists as a whole, but that also which is partial, is exempt from sensible colors, from apparent figures, and from corporeal contact, what therefore is there venerable in this? if it is also present to natures themselves, but it is necessary to extend colors, and figures, and contacts, from on high as far as to the last of things, and to evince that the super celestial place, is similarly exempt from all these, for soul also and intellect participate of figure, and contact is frequently in incorporeal natures, according to the communion of first with secondary beings, and it is usual to call these communications contacts and to denominate the touchings of intellectual perceptions adhesions, we should not therefore be carried from things first to things last, nor compare the highest order of intellectuals with the last of beings, above which both soul and nature are established, for in so doing we shall err, and shall not attend to Plato, who exclaims that it is boldness to assert these things concerning it, for where is the boldness, and what the unknown power transcending our conceptions, in contemplating the truth of sensible colors, figures, and contacts, for an hypostasis of this kind is known by physiologists, and not by the sons of theologists, such therefore is the power possessed by the negations through which Plato celebrates the super celestial place. Chapter Z i.e. Again then, let us in the next place survey the affirmations, how they exist according to the participation of the first intelligibles themselves, the super celestial place therefore, is said to be essence which truly is because it participates of that which is primarily being, for to be, and truly to be a present to all things, as the progeny of the intelligible essence, for as the one is from the first principle which is prior to intelligibles, so the nature of being is from intelligibles, for there the one being subsists, as Parmenides a little before taught us, but the super celestial place is beheld by the governor of the soul, because it is allotted an intelligible transcendency with respect to the other intellectual gods. Hence the intelligible good of it is rendered manifest from its being known by intellect. This intelligible therefore, in the same manner as that which is truly being, arrives to it from the unical gods, for they are primarily and imparticipably intelligibles, and the first efficient causes of all intelligibles. These things also concur with each other, viz that which is truly being, and the intelligible, for every intelligible is truly being, and everything which is truly being is intelligible. For intellect is intelligible according to the being which is in it, but according to its Gnostic power it is intellect. Hence also every intellect is the supplier of knowledge, but every intelligible is the supplier of essence. For that which each is primarily, it imparts by illumination to the secondary orders. Chapter Ziv. 
In the third place therefore, the genus of true science is said to be established about the super-celestial place, for these two things are sent to the contemplation of that essence, viz. intellect the governor of the soul, but this is a partial intellect established indeed above souls, and elevating them to their paternal port, and true science which is the perfection of the soul, this therefore energizes about that place, as transitively revolving in harmonic measure about being but intellect contemplates it, as employing simple intellection, farther still, the science which is in us is one thing, but that which is in the super-celestial place another, and the former indeed is true, but the latter is truth itself, what therefore is it, and whence does it subsists, it is indeed a deity which is the fountain of all intellectual knowledge, and the first efficient cause of undefiled and stable intelligence, twelve, but it shines forth in the first triad of intellectuals, because this is perfective of all other things, and likewise of divine souls, for these ascending to this uniform power of all knowledge, perfect their own knowledge, for each of the undefiled souls, says Socrates, revolving together with Jupiter and the heaven, surveys justice, temperance and science, hence, these three fountains are there, being intelligible deities, and the fountains of the intellectual virtues, and not being, as some think they are, intellectual forms for Plato is accustomed to characterize these by the term itself, as for instance science itself and justice itself, and this Socrates says somewhere in the Fado, by who when he says justice herself, temperance herself, and science herself, he appears to unfold to a certain self-perfect and intelligible deities, which have a triadic subsistence, and of these science indeed is the monad, but temperance has the second order, and justice the third, and science indeed is the supplier of undefiled firm and immutable intelligence, but temperance imparts to all the gods the cause of conversion to themselves, and justice imparts to them the cause of the distribution of the whole of good according to desert, and through science indeed, each of the gods intellectually perceives the natures prior to himself, and is filled with intelligible intelligence, 13, but through temperance he is converted to himself and enjoys a second union, and a good coordinate to the conversion to himself, and through justice he rules over the natures posterior to himself, in a silent path, as they say measures their desert, and supplies a distribution adapted to each, these three fountains therefore contain all the energies of the gods, and science indeed proceeds analogous to the first triad of intelligibles, and as that triad imparts essence to all things, so this illuminates the gods with knowledge, but temperance proceeds analogous to the second triad of intelligibles for temperance imitates the connective and measuring power of the triad, since it measures the energies of the gods, and converts each of them to itself, and justice proceeds analogous to the third triad of intelligibles, for it also separates secondary natures according to appropriate desert, 14, in the same manner as that triad separates them intelligibly by the first paradigms. Chapter XV. After these things therefore, we may survey another triad pre-existing in this place, which also Socrates celebrates, viz. the plane of truth, the meadow, and the nutriment of the gods. The plane of truth therefore, is intellectually expanded to intelligible light, and is splendid with the illuminations that proceed from thence. For as the one emits by illumination intelligible light, so the intelligible imparts to secondary natures our participation productive of essence. But the meadow is the prolific power of life, and of all various reasons, is the comprehension of the first efficient causes of life, and is the cause of the variety, and generation of forms, for the meadows also which are here are productive of all various forms and reasons, and the water which is the symbol of vivification, and the nourishing cause of the gods, is a certain intelligible union, comprehending in itself the whole perfection of the gods, and filling the gods with acme and power, in order that they may bestow providential attention to secondary natures, and may possess an immutable intellectual perception of such natures as a firsts, above however, the gods participate of these uniformly, but in a divided manner in their progressions, with respect to the nutriment likewise, one kind is called by Plato Ambrosia, but the other nectar, for the charioteer, says he, stopping the horses at the manger, places before them Ambrosia, and afterwards gives them nectar to drink, the charioteer therefore, being nourished with intelligibles uniquely participates of the perfection which is imparted through illumination by the gods, but the horses participate of this divisibly, first indeed of ambrosia, and afterwards of nectar, for it is necessary that from ambrosia, 
they should stably and undeviatingly abide in more excellent natures, but that through nectar they should immutably provide for secondary natures, for they say that ambrosia is solid, but nectar liquid nutriment, which Plato also indicates when he says that the charioteer places before the horses ambrosia and afterwards gives them nectar to drink. Hence the nutriment of nectar manifests the unrestrained and indissoluble nature of providence, and its proceeding to all things in an unpolluted manner, but the nutriment of ambrosia manifests stability, and a firm settlement in more excellent natures, from both these however, it is evident that the gods both abide and proceed to all things, and that neither their undeviating nature, and which is without conversion to subordinate beings, is unprolific nor their prolific power and progression is unstable, but abiding they proceed, and being established in the divinities prior to themselves, they provide for secondary natures without being contaminated. Nectar and ambrosia therefore, are the perfections of the gods, so far as they are gods, but other things are the perfections of intellect, nature, and bodies. Hence Plato having assumed these in souls, calls the souls, which are nourished with these, gods for so far as they also participate of the gods, so far they are filled with nectar and ambrosia. These however in their progressions have a bipartite division, the one indeed, being the supplier to the gods of stable and firm perfection, but the other, of undeviating providence, of liberated administration, and of an unenvying and abundant communication of good, according to the two principles of the whole of things, which preside over a distribution of this kind. For it must be admitted that ambrosia is indeed analogous to bound, but nectar to infinity, hence the one is as it were humid, and not bounded from itself, but the other is as it were solid, and has a boundary from itself, nectar therefore is prolific, and is perfective of the secondary presence of the gods, and is the cause of power, of a vigor which provides for the whole of things, and of infinite and never failing supply, but ambrosia is stable perfection, is similar to bound, is the cause to the gods of an establishment in themselves, and is the supplier of firm and undeviating intellection, prior to both these however, is the one fountain of perfection, and seat to all the gods, which Plato calls nutriment, and the banquet, and delicious food, as uniquely perfecting indeed the divided multitude of the gods, but converting all things to itself through divine intelligence, for this, the banquet, indeed manifests the divided distribution of divine nutriment, but Fini. delicious food, the united conversion of the whole of things to it, for it is the intellectual perception of the gods, so far as they are gods, but nutriment connectedly contains both these powers, being the plenitude of intelligible goods, and the uniform perfection of divine self-sufficiency. Concerning these things therefore, thus much may suffice as to the present theory, but it follows that we should discuss the division of the super-celestial place into three parts. For the intelligible summit of intellectuals is, as we have before observed, a triad. Immediately therefore, according to the first conception of this place, Plato unfolds its triadic nature, assuming indeed, three negatives, the uncolored, the unfidueled, and the untangable, having likewise established three divinities in it, viz. science, temperance, and justice, our preceptor and leader, Serenus, thinks fit to divide this triad into three monads and also demonstrates this conformably to the Orphic theologies, if, however, it be requisite to discover the definite peculiarities of these three goddesses, from what has been already laid down, we must understand, that the plane of truth, the meadow, and the nourishing cause of the gods are posited there, to nourish therefore is the province of intelligible perfection, hence the elevating impulse is given to the wing of the soul, and also intellectual perfection, according to the nourishment which flows from thence into the soul. But the peculiarity of the meadow, is to possess a power generative of regions and forms, and of the causes, fifteen of the production of animals, hence also souls are fed about the meadow, and the pabulum Nomi. is indeed nutriment, but in a divided manner, the plane however of truth is the expansion and manifestation of intelligible light, the evolution of inward reasons, and perfection proceeding everywhere, this therefore, sixteen, is the peculiarity of the third monad, but fecundity is the peculiarity of the second, and intelligible plenitude of the first, for all the super celestial place is indeed illuminated with the light of truth, hence all the natures that are contained in it are called true, and Socrates says, 
that whatever soul attending on divinity has beheld anything of reality shall be free from damage, till another period takes place, for everything in that place is truly being and intelligible, and is full of divine union. In the first monads however, i.e. in the plane of truth and the meadow, this intelligible light subsists contractedly, and is occultly established as it were in the editor, but in the third monad, viz. in the nourishing cause of the gods, it shines forth, and is co-expanded, and is co-divided with the multitude of powers. We may therefore from these things survey the differences of the three monads, in a manner conformable to the Platonic hypothesis, but if indeed science pertains to the first monad, temperance to the second, and justice to the third, from these things also the triad will be perfectly apparent, and does not science which is stable, and the uniform intelligence of wholes, and which at the same time is consubsistent with intelligibles, pertain to the power which is united to the intelligible father, and which does not proceed, nor separate its union from the deity of that father but does not the genus of justice pertain to the power which is divided, which separates the intellectual genera, led the intelligible multitude into order, and imparts by illumination distribution according to desert, and does not the genus of temperance pertain to the power which is the medium of both these, which is converted to itself, and possesses the common bond of this triad, for the harmonic, and a communication with the extremes according to reason, are the illustrious good of this middle power, that we may not therefore be prolix, what has been said being sufficient to remind us of the meaning of Plato, those three deities are celebrated by us, which dividing the super-celestial place, are indeed all of them intelligible as in intellectuals, and are likewise summits, and collective of all things into one intelligible union, one of these however is so stably, another generatively, and another convertively, possessing a primary effective power in intellectuals, for one of them indeed, unites the monads of all the gods and collects them about the intelligible, but another affects this about the progressions of the gods, and another about their conversions, all of them however at the same time collect into one the whole of an hypoxis which always abides, proceeds, and returns, hence also Plato elevates the gods that are distributed in the world, to this one place, and converts them energizing about this as collective of the whole orders of the gods to the participation of intelligibles, these monads, therefore, educe intelligible forms, fill them with the participation of divine union, and again recall the natures that have proceeded, and conjoin them to intelligibles, concerning this whole triad however, what has been said may suffice. Chapters VI. It remains therefore, that we should pass to the discussion of Adrastia, Socrates indicating that she possesses her kingdom in this place. For that which defines the measures of a blameless life to souls from the vision of these intelligible goods, is certainly there allotted its first evolution into light, for the elevating cause, being secondary to the objects of desire, may be able to raise both itself and other things to the super-celestial place, through conversion, but that which defines and measures the fruits of the vision of the intelligible to souls, since it has its hypoxis in the intelligible, imparts by illumination beatitude to them from thence, it is established therefore, as I have said, in that place but it rules over all the divine laws uniformly, from on high, as far as to the last of things, it likewise binds to the one sacred law of itself, all the sacred laws, viz. the intellectual, the supermundane, and the mundane, whether therefore, there are certain Saturnian laws, as Socrates in the Gorgias indicates there are, when he says, the law therefore which was in the time of Saturn is now also among the gods, or whether there are Jovian laws, as the Athenian guest asserts there are, when he says, but justice follows Jupiter, which is the avenger of those that desert the divine law, or whether there are fatal laws, as Tsamos teaches there are, when he says, that the Demiurgus announced to souls the laws of fate, of all these the sacred law of Adrastia is connective according to one intelligible simplicity, and at the same time imparts existence to all of them, and the measures of power, and if it be requisite to relate my own opinion, the inevitable guardian power of this triad, and the immutable comprehension of order pervading everywhere, presubsist in this goddess, for these three deities not only unfold and collect all things, but they are also guardians according to the oracle of the works of the Father, and of one intelligible intellect, this guardian power therefore, the sacred law of Adrastia indicates, which nothing is able to escape, for with respect to the laws of fate, not only the gods are superior to them, but also partial souls, when they live according to intellect, and give themselves up to the light of providence, 
and the Saturnian gods are essentially exempt from the Jovian laws, and the connective and perfective gods from the Saturnian laws, but all things are obedient to the sacred law of Adrastra, and all the distributions of the gods, and all measures and guardianships subsist on account of this, by Orpheus also, she is said to guard the demiurgus of the universe and receiving brazen drumsticks, and a drum made from the skin of a goat, to produce so loud a sound as to convert all the gods to herself, and Socrates imitating this fabulous sound which extends a certain proclamation, 17, to all things, in a similar manner produces the sacred law of Adrastia to all souls, for he says, this is the sacred law of Adrastia, that whatever soul has perceived anything of truth, shall be free from harm till another period, all but expressing the Orphic sound through this proclamation, and uttering this as a certain hymn of Adrastra, for in the first place indeed, he calls it Thesmos. a sacred law, and not Nomos. a law, as he does the Saturnian and Jovian laws, for Thesmos. is connected with deity, and pertains more to intelligibles, than to the intellectuals, but Nomos. indicating intellectual distribution, is adapted to the intellectual fathers, and in the second place, he speaks of it in the singular and not in the plural number, as Tsamos does of the fatal laws, in the third place therefore, he extends it to all the genera of souls, and evinces that it is the common measure of their happy and blessed life, and the true guard of those souls that are able to abide on high free from all passivity, for such is the meaning of the words. And the soul that is able to do this always, shall always be free from harm, this sacred law therefore, comprehends all the undefiled life of divine souls, and the temporal blessedness of partial souls, and it guards the former indeed intelligibly, but measures the latter by the vision of intelligible goods, and thus much concerning Adrastra. Chapters VIE. With respect to what remains therefore, we shall summarily say, that the super-celestial place is the first triad of the intelligible and at the same time intellectual gods, possessing three peculiarities, the unfolding into light, the collective, and the defensive, it likewise comprehends all these intelligibly, and in an unknown manner, conjoining indeed intellectuals to intelligibles, but calling forth the prolific powers of intelligibles, receiving in itself the plenitude of forms from the intelligible paradigms, and producing its own meadow from the frontal summit which is there, but from the one intellect it gives subsistence to the three virtues, perfects all itself by intelligible impressions, and in its ineffable bosoms receives the whole of intelligible light, at one and the same. Time also it abides in the occult nature of the intelligible gods, and proceeds intelligibly from thence, shines forth to the view of intellectuals, and converts and draws upward by ineffable powers all the images of its proper union which it has disseminated in everything, to this place likewise it is necessary that we should mystically approach, leaving in the earth all the generation producing life, and the corporeal nature, with which on coming hither we were surrounded as with a wall, but exciting alone the summit of the soul to the participation of total truth, and the plenitude of intelligible nutriment. Chapter 6. After this intelligible and unknown triad however, which presides over all the intellectual, 18, genera, let us survey the triad which connectedly contains the bond of them, intelligibly and at the same time intellectually, for it is necessary that prior to intellect and the intellectual gods, the cause of connectedly containing should be in these gods, and that this being established in the middle of the intelligible and intellectual order, should extend to all the divine multitudes, all the genera of beings, and all the divisions of the world, for what is it which primarily connects things, if, as some say, the nature of spirit and local motion, body itself which is connective of other things will require connection, for every body according to its own composition is dissipable and divisible, which also the Alin guest indicating to those who make corporeal principles, says that the essence which is so much celebrated by them, is broken and dissipated, body therefore, is not naturally adapted to be connective of other things, nor even if a power of this kind pertained to bodies, would spirit be able to afford us this power, because it is always deathless and dissipated, and diffusing itself beyond that which bounds it. But if we suppose that habits and connective forms which are divided about bodies illuminate their subjects with connection, it is perfectly necessary that they should effect this by being present with them, but how will these habits and forms connect themselves, for it is difficult to devise how this can be effected, for these being distributed about material bulks, and divided together with their subjects, require a boundary and connection, 
but they are not naturally adapted to be bounded or connected from themselves, because they have not an essence self-begotten and self-subsistent, that however, which neither produces nor perfects itself, cannot connect itself, and moreover, every habit, and every material form is automotive, and depends on another more ancient cause, and on this account is inseparable from subjects, not being able to verge to itself, but if abandoning these, we should assert that souls which are incorporeal and self-begotten, are the first efficient causes of connection, where shall we place the partible and at the same time impartible nature of souls, that which is mixed from the partible and impartible, that which participates of the genera of being, and that which is divided into harmonic reasons, for souls indeed, connect bodies and natures, because they participate of an impartible peculiarity, but they are in want of another connective nature which may impart the first principle of mixture to the genera, and of connection to divided reasons, for the self-motive nature of souls being transitive, and extended to time, requires that which may connect its one life, and may render it total and indivisible, for the whole which is connective of parts, exists prior to parts, since the whole which consists of parts receives connection introduced from something different from itself. But if proceeding with the reasoning power beyond souls, we survey intellect, whether the intellect which has participated, or if you are willing, that which is imparticipable and divine, and in short, if we survey at once the intellectual genus of the gods, if this is primarily connective of beings, we shall find also in this all various multitude, divisions of genera, and as Socrates says, many and blessed visions, and discursive energies, for the separation of divine natures, and the variety of forms, present themselves to the view in intellectuals, and also fabulous sections and generative powers, how therefore, can that which connects be primarily here, where the divisive genus shines forth, and how is it possible that intellectual multitude should not refer to another more ancient cause the participation of its proper connection, for intellectual multitude is that which is primarily connected, since it is that which is primarily divided, and that which requires connection is divisible, but the indivisible itself is beyond the connective hypoxis, but it is not that which primarily connects, for everything which is connected, is connected by another thing which primarily possesses the power of connection, it is evident therefore, from what has been said, that the connective order of beings is established prior to the intellectual gods, the intelligible indeed, and occult hypoxis, is the supplier of union to all things, as proximately subsisting after the one, and being indivisible and uniform, but connection is the contraction of multitude into impartable communion, on which account it subsists as secondary to intelligibles, for the medium which was there was intelligible, and the united primarily efficient cause of connection, the connective however, of intelligibles and intellectuals, imitates the unific power of intelligibles, for there the three triadic monads were the unions of wholes, one of them indeed according to transcendency, another according to the middle center, and another according to conversion, but in the intelligible and at the same time intellectual orders, these three triads are the second after those unions, and are connoissant with multitude, hence one of these triads is collective, another is connective of multitude, and another is of a perfective nature, for that which is collected, that which is connected, 19, and that which is perfected, is multitude, whether therefore it is intellectual, or super mundane, or mundane, or any other multitude, it is collected, connected, and perfected through these three triads, and when collected indeed, it is elevated to the union of intelligibles, and is firmly established in them, when it is connected, it abides impartable and undissipated in its progeny, and when it is perfected, it receives completion from its proper parts or powers, since however, it is necessary that beings abiding, proceeding and returning should enjoy this triple providence, there are indeed three pre-existent collective monads, three connective, and three perfective, monads, and we do not say this, that on account of the good of secondary natures, first natures are thus divided, and preside over so many orders and powers, but they indeed are always the primary causes of good to things subordinate, while we from inferior natures recur to the causes of wholes, the intelligible therefore, and intellectual triads, perfect things triadically, and always connect and collect them into union but the intelligible monads generate without separation and uniquely, their permanences, progressions and conversions, with respect to other things however, we have partly spoken, and shall again partly speak concerning them.
chapter XX. Let us therefore speak at present concerning the connective triad. This then, Socrates, in the Phaedrus, calls the celestial circulation, because indeed, it possesses the middle center of imparticipable life, and is that which is most vital itself of life, he calls it circulation, as comprehending circularly, and on all sides all other lives, and divine intellections, for on account of this, souls also which are elevated to it, are perfected according to intellection, and are conjoined with intelligible spectacles, the circulation of the heaven, however, is always established after the same manner, for it is an eternal, whole, one, and united intelligence, but the circulation of souls is effected through time, subsists in a more partial manner, and is not an at once collected comprehension of intelligibles, souls, therefore, are carried round in a circle, and are restored to their pristine state, the celestial circulation always remaining the same, because, however, it gives completion to the bond of the intelligible and intellectual gods, and connects all the orders in their abiding, proceeding, and returning, Socrates calls it celestial, for Tzimorse says, that this, sensible, heaven also, compresses on all sides the L. Ments that are under it, and that on this account, no place is left for a vacuum, as, therefore, the apparent heaven is connective of all things that are under it, and is the cause of continuity, coherence and sympathy, for the intervention of a vacuum would interrupt the continuity of things, and the subversion of this continuity would destroy the sympathy of bodies thus also that intellectual heaven, binds all the multitudes of beings into an impartable communion, illuminating each with an appropriate portion of connection for intellect participates of the connective cause in one way, the nature of soul in another, and a corporeal state of being in another, for through the highest participation of connection, intellect is impartible, but through second measures of participation, soul is partible and impartible, according to one mixture, and through an ultimate diminution, bodies possessing a partible hypostasis, at the same time remain connected, and do not in consequence of being dissipated perish, but enjoy their own division and imbecility. The whole of the connective triad therefore, is denominated heaven according to the hypoxis of itself, but the breadth of life which is spread under it is called circulation, for in things apparent to sense, the period of the heavens is motion, and is as it were the life of body. Chapters C. If however it be requisite to discover the triadic nature of it from what has been laid down, we must employ the mode of analogy. Since therefore Plato himself calls the back of the heaven one thing, and its profundity another, it is evident that the celestial arch is the third thing, for the arch which is under this, he directly calls subcelestial. But as we say that the super-celestial place is established above the back of the heaven, so likewise we must grant that the subcelestial is different from the celestial arch, for the heaven is bounded, supernally indeed by the back, but beneath by the arch and it is comprehended indeed by the super-celestial place, but it comprehends the sub-celestial arch. It is evident therefore from these things, that the heaven presents itself to our view as triadic, according to its back indeed, connectedly containing all things in one simplicity, but according to its arch bounding the whole triad, and according to its profundity, itself proceeding into itself, and constituting the middle breadth of connection and coherence. The back however, of the whole celestial order, is an intelligible deity, being perhaps allotted from hence this appellation, but it is intelligible as in the connective triad, externally compressing, and connectedly comprehending all the kingdom of the heaven, it likewise imparts to all the gods by illumination a uniform and simple comprehension of secondary natures, and is supernally filled with intelligible union, hence also, divine souls being led through all the celestial profundity, stand indeed on the back of the heaven, but the circulation carries them round as they stand, and thus they survey what is called the super-celestial place. The station therefore, is the establishment of souls in the intelligible watchtower of the heaven, extending to souls sameness, undefiled power, and undeviating intellection, but the circumduction is the participation of a life full of vigor, and the most acute energy, and the common presence of both these, comprehends the prolific energy, the quiet motion, and the stable intellection of intelligibles but the celestial profundity, is the one continuity of the whole triad, and the middle deity which conjoins the whole, twenty, celestial order, proceeding indeed, from the intelligible comprehension, but ending in the celestial arch, which defines the boundary of the whole of the heaven, 
There is therefore, one union and connection of all this triad, and an indissoluble progression from the back as far as to the arch, through this middle deity which is connoissant with both the extremes, and which unfolds indeed the connective multitude, but on each side is bounded by the extremes, one of which comprehends it supernally, but the other from beneath bounds its progression, the celestial arch therefore remains, which is the boundary beneath of the triad, and this is also the case with the intellect which is in it, being filled indeed by life, but united by the intelligible, and converting all the triad to its principle, for the arch also is similar to the back of the heaven, though according to interval it is less, through subjection therefore it is diminished, but through similitude it is converted to the celestial summit, and this is the celestial intellect which is the proximate sunotius, 21 of the sub-celestial arch, hence each, 22, arch is called the intellectual boundary of the intelligible and intellectual gods, the whole connective triad therefore, is allotted such a division as this, the back, Tonoton. according to the intelligible, Katatonoiton. the profundity according to life, and the arch according to intellect, but the whole of it is one and continued, because that which connects all other things, ought much more to be connective of itself, for each peculiarity of the gods begins its energy from itself, the peculiarity indeed, which is collective, fixing itself collectively in the highest union, that which is convertive of wholes, converting itself to the principle, and that which is undefiled preserving itself prior to other things pure from matter, hence the connective peculiarity also, prior to its participants, connects itself intelligibly and intellectually, and through this connection the nature of the heaven is asserted to be one and continued, for all the triad converges to itself, and preserves its proper wholeness united, and most similar to itself according to nature, and the arch indeed, proximately connects all intellectuals, and compresses them on all sides, but prior to this, the celestial profundity itself, which also comprehends the arch, binds together the whole orders, and prior to these, the celestial back uniformly comprehends according to one ambit of simplicity, all the celestial kingdom itself, and all things that are contained under it, and binds them to themselves, by connective power and hypoxis, for in the things also that are apparent to sense, the concave circumference of the heavens, proximately compresses the elements, and does not suffer them in their indefinite motions on all sides, to be dissipated and blown away, and still prior to these, the celestial bulk strongly compresses and impels all things to the middle, and leaves no void place, but there is one comprehension of all these, viz the back of the heavens, which is the cause to the heavens of similitude, and to the elements of contact with the heavens, for the smooth and equable nature of the back of the heavens as Timor says, makes the whole of heaven similar to itself, and always the natures which comprehend are connective of the natures that are comprehended, it is necessary therefore from things that are apparent, to transfer the similitude to the father of the intellectual gods, heaven, and to survey how he is both one and triple, supernally indeed, and beneath, possessing the intelligible and intellect, but according to the middle possessing life, which being the cause of progressions and intervals, and generative powers, we have properly arranged a chord. I to interval under the celestial profundity, 23, since Plato himself also calls the sum at the back, for those, says he, that are called immortals, when proceeding beyond the heaven they arrive at the summit, stand on the back of the heaven, he calls therefore, the summit of the celestial order, and beyond, the back of the heaven, which things are in a remarkable manner the prerogatives of the first of the synoches, for connectedly containing all things in the one summit of his hypoxis, according to the oracle, he wholly exists beyond, and is united to the super celestial place, and to the ineffable power of it, being enclosed on all sides by it, and shutting himself in the uniform comprehension of intelligibles, for what difference is there between saying that the first of the synoches is shut in the intelligible place of survey, and evincing that it is proximately comprehended by the super celestial place, which was intelligible, but expanded in intellectuals, if however, that which is beyond is the first, the summit is evidently co-arranged with the rest, and is exempt from them, but if the first is a thing of this kind, being established according to the intelligible summit, and imparting by illumination to the other gods, contact with the intelligible. And with the paternal port, it is indeed necessary that there should be a middle and an extremity, the one according to the celestial profundity, but the other according to the termination of the whole circulation, 
If however the circulation of the whole of the heaven is one and continued, the peculiarity of this order must be assigned as the cause of this, for being connective of the whole orders of the gods, and prior to other things of itself, and being as it were the center and bond of the divine genera, it in the first place binds and connects itself, and extends itself to one life the heaven therefore is one and at the same time triple, and proceeds into three monads, being both an apparent and apparent, and that which is between these, and imitating the intelligible gods who subside into intelligible triads. Chapters Xi. If you are willing however from what is written in the Cratylus, to see the peculiarity of this order, in the first place, let this be considered by you as an argument of the Sinosha established in the middle, that a twofold habitude of it is delivered, one, towards intelligibles, but the other towards intellectuals, for it is said to see the things above, and to generate a pure intellect, hence, of intelligibles it is the intelligence, but of intellectuals the intelligible, for the cause of intellect subsists prior to an intellectual cause, and that which is at once both these, especially gives completion to the middle order of intelligibles and intellectuals, for the collective deity, perceiving intelligibles, or rather being united to them, does not primarily give subsistence to a divine intellect, and the perfective deity, producing together with the middle divinity intellectuals, proximately perceives intellectually the celestial order, and not the intelligibles prior to the heaven, but the middle divinity alone, occupying the intelligible and intellectual center, equally indeed extends to both, but perceiving intelligibles intellectually, it is the cause of intellectuals intelligibly, since however, habitude to its causes precedes the power, 24, in it which is generative of intellectuals, Socrates beginning from this habitude, delivers also a second power as suspended from it, but sight directed to things above is very properly assigned the appellation of celestial, as seeing the things above, this therefore, perfectly defines for us a habitude more ancient than the connectedly containing order, jointly. Assuming it to be intellectual as with reference to intelligibles, and sight as with reference to the objects of sight, though it intellectually perceives itself, and is intelligible in itself. But the intelligible of it, as with reference to that which is primarily intelligible, is allotted an intellectual order. What follows however, unfolds the habitude of this middle to intellectuals, for Socrates adds, whence also, O Hermogenes, those who are conversant with things on high say that heaven generates a pure intellect, and that this name is properly assigned to it, the order therefore, of the heaven is expanded as a middle in the middle intellectual and intelligible gods comprehending at once the intelligible and intellectual in one impartable connection, subsisting similarly with respect to each of these, and being equally distant from the first intellectuals, and the unical intelligibles, hence it is said to perceive intellectually the things above, and thus to produce, a pure, intellect, assuming this therefore, in the first place from what has been laid down, in the next place we should attend to this, that the celestial order being triple, and the whole of it intellectually perceiving intelligibles, and producing intellectuals, the first monad ended in an eminent manner intellectually perceives intelligibles, for it mingles itself with intelligibles, knows intelligible intellect, is united to the natures prior to itself, and is impartable as in impartables, super expanding itself towards intelligible simplicity, but the third monad is especially generative of intellectuals, since it is the intellect of the whole connective triad, and with the Orphic theologists also, Heaven the father of Saturn is the third, but the middle monad produces together with the third the intellectual order of the gods, but is conjoined together with the first two intelligibles, and is filled indeed with intelligible union from the firsts, but fills the third, twenty-five, with prolific powers. Do you not see therefore, how Plato through the peculiarity of the extremes, unfolds to us the whole celestial order, conjoining indeed, the intelligible hypoxis of it to intelligibles? but its intellectual hypoxis to intellectuals, and affording us the means of collecting its hypoxis which is the middle of both these, and which proceeds according to a common peculiarity, for if you likewise wish to assume this from what has been said, the celestial light is conjoined to the light of intelligibles, for sight is nothing else than light, the middle order therefore, by its own light, and by the divine summit of itself is conjoined to the first natures, but by an intellectual nature, and the boundary of the whole triad, it generates intellect, and all the unpolluted deity of intellectuals, for it does not produce intellect by itself, but in conjunction with purity, for this Socrates himself asserts, whence also, 
they say, that a pure intellect is generated by it, hence the celestial order is the first efficient cause of the intellectual hypoxis, and of undefiled power, if however it is necessary that purity should not be inherent in intellect from accident, it is the deity of those beings that are exempt from secondary natures, and is the supplier of immutable power, which the mighty heaven producing in conjunction with intellect, is at the same time the efficient cause of the gods who are the sources of purity, and of the intellectual fathers. These indications therefore of the truth concerning the connective gods, may also be assumed from the Kratilus. Chapters Xue. It remains therefore that in conformity to what is written in the Phaedrus, we should survey the sub-celestial arch, and the peculiarity of the gods that are there, before however we begin the doctrine concerning it, I wish to premise thus much, that some of the most celebrated of the interpreters prior to us, conceiving that the sub-celestial arch is a divine order arranged under the heaven, have thought fit to rank it immediately after the first god, calling the first god heaven, but others have arranged both the heaven, and the sub-celestial arch in the breadth of intelligibles, for the Asinan philosopher ended, Theodorus, being persuaded by Plotinus, calls that which proximately proceeds from the ineffable, the sub-celestial arch, as in his treatise concerning names he philosophizes about these things, but the great Iamblichus conceiving the mighty heaven to be a certain order of the intelligible gods, and in one place he considers it to be the same with the Demiurgus, asserts that the order proximately established under the heaven, and as it were begirding it, is the sub-celestial arch, and these things he has written in his commentaries on the Phaedrus. Let no one therefore think that we make any innovation concerning the theology of this order, and that we are the first who divide the sub-celestial arch from the heaven, but that we are principally persuaded by Plato, who distinguishes these three orders, the super-celestial place, the celestial circulation, and the sub-celestial arch, and that after Plato, we are persuaded by those who investigate his theory in a divinely inspired manner, viz. by Iamblichus and Theodorus. For why is it necessary to speak of our leader, Serenus, who was truly a Bacchus, i.e. one agitated with divine fury, and who in a remarkable manner was full of deity about Plato, and caused as far as to us the admirable nature of the Platonic theory, and the astonishment with which it is attended, to shine forth, he therefore in his treatise on the Concord of Orpheus, Pythagoras, and Plato, has most perfectly unfolded the peculiarity of this order, the sub-celestial arch. The two above mentioned wise men, however, differ very much from each other in their theory, for Theodorus, in calling the first cause heaven, does not any longer permit heaven to be sight perceiving the things above, as Socrates in the Cratylus etymologizes it to be, for the first god neither sees, nor is sight, nor is inferior to anything, neither therefore does Theodorus admit this explanation of the name, nor does he celebrate the super celestial place as Socrates does wider the influence of divine inspiration, for there is neither any works of Proclus, plenitudes of intelligibles as far as to the last of things, it likewise elevates all things at once, according to one common union, as far as to the intelligible father, and generates and produces them as far as to matter, being therefore established between the unical and the multiplied gods, it is unfolded, negatively indeed through the unknown manner in which it transcends secondary natures, but affirmatively through its participation of the first natures, for the first Demiurgus is called in the Timor's fabricator and father, and good, and all such names, so far as he participates of pre-existent causes, but so far as he is the monad of all fabrication, Plato leaves him unknown and ineffable, exempt from all the fabricators of things, for he says, it is difficult to discover him, and when found, it is impossible to speak of him to all men, thus therefore Plato unfolds the super-celestial place, affirmatively indeed, as being filled from the first causes, at one time indeed calling it essence which truly is, at another the plane of truth, and at another, something else of this kind, but, eleven, so far as it transcends the intellectual gods, and so far as it is supreme and unical, he celebrates it negatively, in the same manner as the principle which is exempt from all things. Chapter Zi. It follows therefore, in the next place, that we should consider what the negations are, and from what orders they are generated. In the Parmenides then, the negations of the one are produced from all the divine orders, because the one is the cause of all of them, and everything divine according to the hypoxis of itself participates of the first principle, 
and the one in consequence of transcending these is in a much greater degree exempt from the natures posterior to these, for from these all things proceed, since they receive partibly the peculiarities of these, this however is evident from the other hypothesis, in which the same conclusions are again circulated, at one time being connected together negatively, and at another affirmatively, for what is there which could be able to subsist, unless it was antecedently comprehended according to cause in holes, but in the phadrus, the things which are denied of the intelligible summit of all intellectuals are the natures which approximately established after this summit, viz. the sacred genera, the connective, the perfective, and the paternal of what are properly called intellectuals. For this summit being exempt from these, it also transcends all the intellectual gods, for what every genus of the gods is to the one, that the three orders posterior to this summit, are to it, Plato therefore denominates the celestial order which connectedly contains holes, and illuminates them with intelligible light, color, because likewise the apparent beauty of this sensible heaven is resplendent with all various colors, and with light, hence he calls that heaven intellectual color, and light. For the light proceeding from the good is, in the orders, above, the heaven, unknown and occult, abiding in the editor of the gods, but it shines forth in this order, and from being unapparent becomes manifest, hence it is assimilated to color the offspring of light. Farther still, if the heaven is sight beholding the things above, the intelligible of it may very properly be called color which is conjoined with the sight, the cause therefore of the intelligibles in the heaven is without color but is exempt from them, for sensible color is the offspring of the solar light, but Plato denominates the order which proximately subsists after the celestial order, and which we have called the subcelestial arch, figure, for the arch itself is the name of a figure, and in short, in this order, Parmenides also places intellectual figure, but Plato first attributes contact to the summit of intellectuals, as is evident from the conclusions of the Parmenides. For in the first hypothesis taking away figure from the one, he uses this as a medium, viz that the one does not touch itself, but the one says he, does not touch itself, and the conclusion is evident, here therefore contact first subsists, and subsists according to cause, for of those things of which the demiurgus is proximately the cause, the father who is prior to him is paradigmatically the cause, in this order therefore, contact is the paradigm of the liberated gods, hence these. Three orders are successive, viz. color, figure, and contact, and from these the super-celestial place is essentially exempt, hence it is without color, without figure, and without contact, nor does it transcend these three privatively, but according to causal excellence, for it imparts to color from intelligibles the participation of light, on figure it confers by illumination intellectual bound, and in contact it supernally inserts union and continuity, and perfects all things by its power. Things which are touched indeed, through union, those that are figured, through the participation of bound, and those that are colored, through the illumination of light, but it draws upward, and allures to itself everything ineffably and through intelligible impressions, and fills everything with unical goods. If therefore, we assert these things rightly, we must not admit the interpretation of those who are busily occupied in sensible colors, and contacts, and figures and who assert that the super-celestial place is exempt from these, for these are trifling, and by no means adapted to that place, for even nature, not only that which exists as a whole, but that also which is partial, is exempt from sensible colors, from apparent figures, and from corporeal contact, what therefore is there venerable in this, if it is also present to natures themselves, but it is necessary to extend colors, and figures, and contacts from on high as far as to the last of things, and to evince that the super-celestial place, is similarly exempt from all these, for soul also and intellect participate of figure, and contact is frequently in incorporeal natures, according to the communion of first with secondary beings, and it is usual to call these communications contacts, and to denominate the touchings of intellectual perceptions adhesions, we should not therefore be carried from things first to things last, nor compare the highest order of intellectuals with the last of beings, above which both soul and nature are established, for in so doing we shall err, and shall not attend to Plato, who exclaims that it is boldness to assert these things concerning it, for where is the boldness, and what the unknown power transcending our conceptions, in contemplating the truth of sensible colors, figures, and contacts, for an hypostasis of this kind is known by physiologists, and not by the sons of theologists.
such therefore is the power possessed by the negations through which Plato celebrates the super-celestial place. Chapter Z.I.E. Again then, let us in the next place survey the affirmations, how they exist according to the participation of the first intelligibles themselves. The super-celestial place therefore, is said to be essence which truly is, because it participates of that which is primarily being, for to be, and truly to be a present to all things, as the progeny of the intelligible essence. For as the one is from the first principle which is prior to intelligibles, so the nature of being is from intelligibles, for there the one being subsists, as Parmenides a little before taught us, but the super celestial place is beheld by the governor of the soul, because it is allotted an intelligible transcendency with respect to the other intellectual gods, hence the intelligible good of it is rendered manifest from its being known by intellect, this intelligible therefore, in the same manner as that which is truly being, arrives to it from the unical gods, for they are primarily and imparticipably intelligibles, and the first efficient causes of all intelligibles, these things also concur with each other, viz that which is truly being, and the intelligible, for every intelligible is truly being, and everything which is truly being is intelligible, for intellect is intelligible according to the being which is in it, but according to its Gnostic power it is intellect, hence also every intellect is the supplier of knowledge, but every intelligible is the supplier of essence, for that which each is primarily, it imparts by illumination to the secondary orders. Chapter Ziv. In the third place therefore, the genus of true science is said to be established about the super-celestial place, for these two things are sent to the contemplation of that essence, viz. intellect the governor of the soul, but this is a partial intellect established indeed above souls, and elevating them to their paternal port, and true science which is the perfection of the soul. This therefore energizes about that place, as transitively revolving in harmonic measure about being, but intellect contemplates it, as employing simple intellection, farther still, the science which is in us is one thing, but that which is in the super-celestial place another, and the former indeed is true, but the latter is truth itself, what therefore is it, and whence does it subsist, it is indeed a deity which is the fountain of all intellectual knowledge, and the first efficient cause of undefiled and stable intelligence, 12, but it shines forth in the first triad of intellectuals, because this is perfective of all other things, and likewise of divine souls, for these ascending to this uniform power of all knowledge, perfect their own knowledge, for each of the undefiled souls, says Socrates, revolving together with Jupiter and the heaven, surveys justice, temperance and science, hence, these three fountains are there, being intelligible deities, and the fountains of the intellectual virtues, and not being, as some think they are, intellectual forms, for Plato is accustomed to characterize these by the term itself, as for instance science itself and justice itself, and this Socrates says somewhere in the Phaedo, by here when he says justice herself, temperance herself, and science herself, he appears to unfold to a certain self-perfect and intelligible deities, which have a triadic subsistence and of these science indeed is the monad, but temperance has the second order, and justice the third, and science indeed is the supplier of undefiled, firm and immutable intelligence, but temperance imparts to all the gods the cause of conversion to themselves, and justice imparts to them the cause of the distribution of the whole of good according to desert, and through science indeed, each of the gods intellectually perceives the natures prior to himself, and is filled with intelligible intelligence, 13, but through temperance he is converted to himself and enjoys a second union, and a good coordinate to the conversion to himself, and through justice he rules over the natures posterior to himself, in a silent path, as they say measures their desert, and supplies a distribution adapted to each, these three fountains therefore contain all the energies of the gods, and science indeed proceeds analogous to the first triad of intelligibles, and as the triad imparts essence to all things, so this illuminates the gods with knowledge. But temperance proceeds analogous to the second triad of intelligibles, for temperance imitates the connective and measuring power of the triad, since it measures the energies of the gods, and converts each of them to itself, and justice proceeds analogous to the third triad of intelligibles, for it also separates secondary natures according to appropriate desert, 14, in the same manner as that triad separates them intelligibly by the first paradigms. Chapter XV after these things therefore, we may survey another triad pre-existing in this place, which also Socrates celebrates, viz the plane of truth, 
the meadow, and the nutriment of the gods. The plane of truth therefore, is intellectually expanded to intelligible light, and is splendid with the illuminations that proceed from thence. For as the one emits by illumination intelligible light, so the intelligible imparts to secondary natures our participation productive of essence. But the meadow is the prolific power of life, and of all various reasons, is the comprehension of the first efficient causes of life, and is the cause of the variety, and generation of forms. For the meadows also which are here are productive of all various forms and reasons, and the water which is the symbol of vivification, and the nourishing cause of the gods, is a certain intelligible union, comprehending in itself the whole perfection of the gods, and filling the gods with acme and power in order that they may bestow providential attention to secondary natures, and may possess an immutable intellectual perception of such natures as a first. Above however, the gods participate of these uniformly, but in a divided manner in their progressions, with respect to the nutriment likewise, one kind is called by Plato Ambrosia, but the other nectar, for the charioteer, says he, stopping the horses at the manger, places before them Ambrosia, and afterwards gives them nectar to drink, the chariot here therefore, being nourished with intelligibles, uniquely participates of the perfection which is imparted through illumination by the gods, but the horses participate of this divisibly, first indeed of ambrosia, and afterwards of nectar, for it is necessary that from ambrosia, they should stably and undeviatingly abide in more excellent natures, but that through nectar they should immutably provide for secondary natures, for they say that ambrosia is solid, but nectar liquid nutriment, which Plato also indicates when he says that the charioteer places before the horses ambrosia and afterwards gives them nectar to drink, hence the nutriment of nectar manifests the unrestrained and indissoluble nature of providence, and its proceeding to all things in an unpolluted manner, but the nutriment of ambrosia manifests stability, and a firm settlement in more excellent natures, from both these however, it is evident that the gods both abide and proceed to all things, and that neither their undeviating nature, and which is without conversion to subordinate beings, is unprolific, nor their prolific power and progression is unstable, but abiding they proceed, and being established in the divinities prior to themselves, they provide for secondary natures without being contaminated. Nectar and ambrosia therefore, are the perfections of the gods, so far as they are gods, but other things are the perfections of intellect, nature, and bodies. Hence Plato having assumed these in souls, calls the souls, which are nourished with these, gods, for so far as they also participate of the gods, so far they are filled with nectar and ambrosia. These however in their progressions have a bipartite division, the one indeed, being the supplier to the gods of stable and firm perfection, but the other, of undeviating providence, of liberated administration, and of an unenvying and abundant communication of good according to the two principles of the whole of things, which preside over a distribution of this kind, for it must be admitted that ambrosia is indeed analogous to bound, but nectar to infinity, hence the one is as it were humid, and not bounded from itself, but the other is as it were solid, and has a boundary from itself, nectar therefore is prolific, and is perfective of the secondary presence of the gods, and is the cause of power, of a vigor which provides for the whole of things, and of infinite and never-failing supply, but ambrosia is stable perfection, is similar to bound, is the cause to the gods of an establishment in themselves, and is the supplier of firm and undeviating intellection, prior to both these however, is the one fountain of perfection, and seat to all the gods, which Plato calls nutriment, and the banquet, and delicious food, as uniquely perfecting indeed the divided multitude of the gods, but converting all things to itself through divine intelligence. For this. The banquet, indeed manifests the divided distribution of divine nutriment, but. Fini. Delicious food, the united conversion of the whole of things to it, for it is the intellectual perception of the gods, so far as they are gods, but nutriment connectedly contains both these powers, being the plenitude of intelligible goods, and the uniform perfection of divine self-sufficiency. Capta X for E. Concerning these things therefore, Thus much may suffice as to the present theory, but it follows that we should discuss the division of the super-celestial place into three parts, for the intelligible summit of intellectuals is, as we have before observed, a triad. Immediately therefore, according to the first conception of this place, Plato unfolds its triadic nature, assuming indeed, three negatives, the uncolored, the unfidual, 
and the untangible, having likewise established three divinities in it, viz. science, temperance, and justice, our preceptor and leader, Serenus, thinks fit to divide this triad into three monads, and also demonstrates this conformably to the Orphic theologies, if, however, it be requisite to discover the definite peculiarities of these three goddesses, from what has been already laid down, we must understand, that the plane of truth, the meadow, and the nourishing cause of the gods are posited there, to nourish therefore is the province of intelligible perfection, hence the elevating impulse is given to the wing of the soul, and also intellectual perfection, according to the nourishment which flows from thence into the soul, but the peculiarity of the meadow, is to possess a power generative of reasons and forms, and of the causes, fifteen of the production of animals, hence also souls are fed about the meadow, and the pabulum. Nor me. Is indeed nutriment, but in a divided manner, the plane however of truth is the expansion and manifestation of intelligible light, the evolution of inward reasons, and perfection proceeding everywhere. This therefore, 16, is the peculiarity of the third monad, but fecundity is the peculiarity of the second, and intelligible plenitude of the firsts, for all the super-celestial place is indeed illuminated with the light of truth, hence all the natures that are contained in it are called true, and Socrates says, that whatever soul attending on divinity has beheld anything of reality shall be free from damage, till another period takes place, for everything in that place is truly being and intelligible, and is full of divine union. In the first monads however, i.e. in the plane of truth and the meadow, this intelligible light subsists contractedly, and is occultly established as it were in the editor, but in the third monad, viz. in the nourishing cause of the gods, it shines forth, and is co-expanded, and is co-divided with the multitude of powers. We may therefore from these things survey the differences of the three monads, in a manner conformable to the Platonic hypothesis, but if indeed science pertains to the first monad, temperance to the second, and justice to the third, from these things also the triad will be perfectly apparent, and does not science which is stable, and the uniform intelligence of wholes, and which at the same time is consubsistent with intelligibles, pertain to the power which is united to the intelligible father, and which does not proceed nor separate its union from the deity of that father but does not the genus of justice pertain to the power which is divided, which separates the intellectual genera, led the intelligible multitude into order, and imparts by illumination distribution according to desert, and does not the genus of temperance pertain to the power which is the medium of both these, which is converted to itself, and possesses the common bond of this triad, for the harmonic, and a communication with the extremes according to reason, are the illustrious good of this middle power, that we may not therefore be prolix, what has been said being sufficient to remind us of the meaning of Plato, those three deities are celebrated by us, which dividing the super-celestial place, are indeed all of them intelligible as in intellectuals, and are likewise summits, and collective of all things into one intelligible union, one of these however is so stably, another generatively, and another convertively, possessing a primary effective power in intellectuals, for one of them indeed, unites the monads of all the gods and collects them about the intelligible, but another effects this about the progressions of the gods, and another about their conversions, all of them however at the same time collect into one the whole of an hypoxis which always abides, proceeds, and returns, hence also Plato elevates the gods that are distributed in the world, to this one place, and converts them energizing about this as collective of the whole orders of the gods to the participation of intelligibles. These monads, therefore, educe intelligible forms, fill them with the participation of divine union, and again recall the natures that have preceded, and conjoin them to intelligibles. Concerning this whole triad however, what has been said may suffice.